Thank you for auditing the Always Positive New Music Review Show, hosted by a French professor who is very excited to talk about one of his favorite albums, Random Access Memories by Daft Punk, and their new 10th anniversary bonus disc. I'm just going to be talking about the new stuff that was just released last week. I am eventually going to do a second part to this video. I'm going to be making the case that Random Access Memories is the greatest album of all time, uh, period. I mean, better than Pet Sounds, better than Revolver, better than Thriller, uh, better than Live at the Acropolis. I mean, the best album of all time. I think there is a case to be made. Actually, over the summer, I'm going to be doing sort of a 2013 retrospective. I didn't pay much attention to new music between 2002 and 2018. The exception was when I was going through my divorce in 2013, it happened to be that there were four masterpieces that came out and I was able to enjoy. So I'm going to be doing uh, videos on those. And it may seem counterintuitive. You know, I'm going to be doing a huge deep dive into Random Access Memories, and here I am talking about this bonus disc, this collection of scraps. You know, is that what this is? Is that what Daft Punk gave us? Did they just do the typical bloated rock star thing and just say, oh, uh, here's some studio recordings, uh, here's some songs that weren't good enough, let's put them here and sell it all again for 50 bucks so that uh, Professor Sky has to spend some more of that Patreon money? No, that's not actually what this is. This, it is scraps, but they're curated scraps, okay? <laughs> these, these guys you know, Toma and Giman, they actually, you can tell, very clearly thought about how to create this bonus material, to the point where I would go as far as to say it's almost an EP. It's almost an EP that shows an alternate timeline, okay? It is simultaneously two things at once. It is curated scraps and the alternate timeline. Also, weirdly enough, the new Zelda game came out the same day as this. I'm all the way back in my 2014 feels. It's, <laughs> it's very bizarre. Uh, I'll get more into that in my video over the summer. But what this EP provides, what this 10th anniversary EP provides, is an alternate timeline, a dystopian timeline, where Random Access Memories was mid, to use the parlance of our time. Now, I don't mean mid. I mean mid for Daft Punk. I mean humans after all mid, meaning a great album that is not up to their standards. And, and what's great is that with this little view into what could have been, what might have been, what would have been awesome but not Random Access Memories, it helps us to better appreciate what Random Access Memories actually is. At the heart of the entire EP, okay, I'm just gonna call it, I'm gonna call it the 10th anniversary EP. At the heart of this EP, this collection of scraps, this alternate history, is a reminder that there is a third robot. There is a third of all the collaborators. There's one whose voice is the most important, whose contribution to the album I think is the most definitive, and who perhaps should be on this standee behind me. I'm of course talking about the person who brought you this album as well, Nile Rodgers. <laughs> Nile Rodgers is completely missing from the EP. Completely missing from the 10th anniversary EP. Every place where he was on the final version, he is not here. And his glaring absence, the difference of rhythm and touch and gorgeousness, is, is not in this EP. It's a reminder by subtraction of what an amazing force Nile Rodgers is. And this is my semi-annual uh, uh, reminder that if you don't know the album Diana by Diana Ross, you're missing out on another perfect album. <laughs> Just, man. And Nile Rodgers uh, you know, is write, writing all the songs there. So that's the heart. That's the heart that is missing from the EP that reminds you of the heart that is on the LP. What we also see in this is that we see this, this difficult transition. When I first listened to Random Access Memories, I didn't like it. Okay, I'll tell, I'll tell the story in my next video. But I first heard it and I was like, this isn't that good. You know? And now, now it's, it's, I'm saying that it's better than Pet Sounds. Okay, uh, That's the kind of band that they are. But in order to be that way, you have to transition. You can't just go from graduation to 808 and heartbreak. There has to be some kind of transition there. You can't just go from Please Please Me to Revolver or whatever it is. You know, there has to be these little middle stages. And what this EP shows you are these awkward adolescents of going from Tron Legacy and Human After All into Random Access Memories. You see it 
form. You see the greatness of random access memories peeking out from the mistakes that they have collected. Not the mistakes, the drafts, the rough drafts that they are showing you here. It's funny, I, I actually, when I, when I write papers, you know, I, I write academic papers, I am an academic, I do have a PhD and all that stuff. Um, I always have an extra document that's just called scraps. So, you know, I wrote a paper on uh, Molière's Bourgeois Gentilhomme. And, and so, you know, on my desktop, I'll have another, I'll have, you know, Bourgeois Gentilhomme dot doc, and then I just have Bourgeois Scraps dot doc. And that's where all the ideas that I have that seem good, and I'll write paragraph and paragraph and paragraph, and it seems great, and it doesn't fit my thesis, it's out of nowhere, cut, paste, I put it into scraps. This whole thing has that beautiful feeling of just like these abandoned ideas and these, these aborted uh, concepts. So let's go through the album now, right? Now, I'm not going to do a stamp, an example song, because... I think this really is curated. I think it's supposed to start and end. I think they chose the, the song order properly, and I think we need to treat it that way. It opens up with Horizon Overture. Vocal sounds of a chorus begin. It's, an, again, an overture to an abandoned idea. This They came straight from Tron Legacy. Thomas is going to end up back in Tron Legacy territory by making his, uh, making his uh, ballet you know, which I reviewed last, uh, last month. But it really sets up this whole second disc, this whole EP, because it has a mournful, bittersweet, gorgeous, analog feel. And this whole EP is going to end with touch and its mournful, bittersweet, gorgeous sound. And it, you realize that they made something that exists perfectly well on its own with these voices to start off, these ah, ah, ah voices, and then eventually ending with your home, right? That's, that's what they did. That's why this is an EP. I get it. They broke up, right? Daft Punk is broken up. Sure. Sure they are. Uh, and, and so we're not going to get anything more. <laughs> but this shows that they're really thinking about what they're doing. Then it goes to Horizon, parentheses, Japan CD. I guess there was a Japanese CD that had this song on it. I'm glad it's not on the final version. Uh, Daft Punk has a special relationship with Japan because Japan loves Daft Punk. Uh, boy, is this does this not fit on Random Access Memories? We have like strummed acoustic guitar. Ugh, it's totally off. It does eventually sound a little bit more in the spirit and sound of Random Access Memories with this great aching pedal steel. And what this whole project has done is I'm gearing up to do my mega random access memories video, which I promise is going to be really good. I, I think I'm going to say a lot of things that a lot of people haven't said. Uh, but I'm really going to be focusing a lot on the musicians. You know, Greg Lies, Lies is the pedal steel player. And the pedal steel is like maybe the third or fourth most important instrument on random access memories. And we hear him here with this smoky... I think it's a Fender Rhodes uh, keyboard that's playing here. One of the key, the key sounds throughout Random Access Memories. This combination of that keyboard and that pedal steel, that is a little indicator. That is thematically consistent with Random Access Memories. And then a really tinny dum, uh, drum machine comes in. Uh, nowhere else, I, I'm trying to think, I don't think anywhere on the album do we have a tinny, sort of intentionally rough sounding drum machine. So it makes sense that it's here. We have these washed out synths. Nathan East, again, is playing fretless bass. He plays bass the entire time. He's the studio bassist of the album. Much more on him in my full video. Uh, then we get some drums by J.R. Robinson. And this was a rabbit hole, and this is a, a teaser for what it's going to be. I, I, th I thought all the drums were played by Omar Hakim, but they weren't. And if you don't know Omar Hakim, he's one of the greatest drummers in the world. So this put me down this rabbit hole and where I realized what Daft Punk actually did with their drummers. If we take the song Giorgio by Marauder uh, as an example, there's two drummers on the track list. The first part that's not super flashy, that's JR. That was Quincy Jones' favorite studio drummer. He was the guy who did all of Off the Wall with Michael Jackson. And he has this like, um, and he's like instant crush, that drum beat, that is the epitome. As epitome of a J.R. Robinson drum beat. Uh, I'll include a link in the description to a modern drummer video where he describes the difference between how he plays a standard beat and how a machine plays a standard beat. He is somebody who understands how to make mechanical sounding beats sound human. 
Okay, that's the level that Daft Punk is working on. They're finding studio musicians who know how to make mechanical things sound human and human things sound alive and mechanical at the same time. They found musicians who do what they do. But then that made me realize that that made J.R. Robinson the rhythm drummer and Omar Hakim the lead drummer. It's like they have two guitars, but they're two drummers. What other, what other album has, has a rhythm drummer? Anyways, well, why is this not on the album? You know, why is this not uh, on the final album? I'm going to be saying that for each of the pieces. You know, why is Overture not on there? It's just, it's lacking brilliance. You know, it's, it's really weighted in this orchestral mode. Uh, the studio musicians are doing the best they, they can, but they're not doing anything particularly interesting. The construction isn't particularly interesting. There isn't really a hook. It's great to have here, but it doesn't have much to it. But it's a nice introduction to this EP. Then we get Give Life Back to Music, GLBTM, what they call an outtake. And this is where we're wondering, you know, how are they structuring this whole thing? Are they just going to go in order of the album? Sort of, because Give Life Back to Music is the first track. And this is really the, the here we go, you know? And when you're listening to this, you're thinking, okay, is this an outtake? No, this isn't an outtake. This is an alternate timeline because something very important is missing. This instrumental version of Give Life Back to Music is missing its defining element. And no, it's not Pharrell. It's not Get Happy uh, Yogi Bear hat guy. It's Nile Rodgers. <laughs> it doesn't matter that it's instrumental. It's that Nile Rodgers is taken out of this song. The blistering guitar lines. What Nile Rodgers is able to do is he has a heavy hand and a light touch at the same time. He is capable of playing rhythm guitar and lead at the same time, okay? I think it's fair to say Nile Rodgers, top three guitarists of all time. I mean, he's that good, he's that important. He's just absolutely amazing. And he's the backbone of this album. I mean, yeah, it would be nice to have Pharrell on here, but I've always, I've always interpreted Pharrell as a placeholder until they could work with The Weeknd, because what they really want was Michael Jackson, but you know, you can't work with Michael Jackson. So here, instead of Nile Rodgers, instead of going for a kind of Diana Ross, Diana feel, which most of the album goes for, it's this full disco orchestra. And hey, <laughs> this disco orchestra is awesome. This is a very interesting alternate take. It's funny that, that you know, Nile Rodgers actually gets songwriting credit on the album version of the song, but not on this extra take, because he's not involved here. His brilliance is not here. And these disco strings, this is a whole thing we can just imagine. Like, what if they went for a more generic sounding disco sound? They knew they wanted to make human analog music. They knew they wanted to do something that was disco. And they ended up going with Now Rogers and that feel and that kind of funk disco hybrid as opposed to just straight disco, what everybody hated disco. But here we have what everybody hated disco with these strings, these great curling ups, you know, curling down strings. Great build up, freak out disco strings. They're like playing the lead line. Eventually there's a part with just the drums and the strings. And then it just goes absolutely nutty where there's like a hammer dulcimer and a piano, just absolute virtuosity, just claps in the back and the drums get more excited. Then there is a guitar, but it's an acoustic guitar. Thank God. Thank God to these man robots uh, that they got rid of the acoustic guitar in the final version. It just does not have any place on this album. Um, nice little bit here with a, a slinky disco bass. So there, there's a couple hallmarks of disco that are the, the stereotypical hallmarks. These strings are them, and the other is a bass line, which plays octaves, doogie, and it kind of slides up and down. So doogie, 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 doogie. That's that kind of do is the root note, get is the is the octave okay so we hear a little bit of that so in this we hear the idea of daft punk going to to disco you know and there's lots of great elements here the spanish guitar almost comes in almost like flamenco rhythms and this is a wonderful document i love having this i love listening to this i do this is a a a a great version of a dish that i love to eat it's not the recipe that is my favorite, okay? But I, 
so many great ingredients such this is the song this gives you that feeling that elation of the song but it's just missing it's missing that Nile Rodgers feel so why is it here not there it would have been a different album this this is that vision of Daft Punk just aping disco not trying to make whatever random access memories would become Next up is Infinity Repeating, uh, featuring uh, Julian Casablancas and The Voids. This, okay, if the song Motherboard, off of Random Access Memories, had a baby with Instant Crush, off of Random Access Memories, it would be Infinity Repeating. It has a lot of the rhythmic interest and the layers of Motherboard. I was re-listening to to uh, Random Access Memories, the, the album, with, with my kids. And every song, like, no, this is my favorite song. No, this is my favorite song. This is one of my no, this is my favorite songs. I love Motherboard. Uh, but it's interesting, because here we have sort of lyrics over that basic idea. I didn't like this song at first. I didn't like this song at second. On the third day, I woke up with the song stuck in my head, and I had to listen to it four times in a row. <laughs> okay, It's that kind of song. I won't actually know how much I like this song, until I have more time with it. It's you know, incomprehensible, these lyrics. I was crossed at the border to old friend coincidence. I don't want any other to old friend coincidences. I don't know. Uh, they're almost like Phoenix style lyrics, you know, like, does this guy speak English? <laughs> and I know he does, but there's just absolutely gorgeous uh, pre-chorus, weekday, weekday. I don't want to play any other game. It's Friday, Friday. Everybody's looking for the weekend, weekend bold choice, and then this really repetitive chorus, and this is what gets in your head, just this repetitive chorus. And then, you know, this is a thing that that, uh, that Julian Casablancas is able to do with the strokes as well, just using his voice. Because he's so good at seeming like he just doesn't care and like he's just a sleazy rock guy, every once in a while he'll pull out these little transcendent vocal moves that just absolutely shock you and he does that in this sort of post-chorus moment. So I, I did a little bit of research and I found a 2014 Stereo Gum article where Julian Casablancas talks about the song eight years before it would be released. It's cool, weird, it's definitely not one-tenth as populicious as Instant Crush, but it's just really weird. It's like a song that goes up, it's like four half steps up, moving as on that cycle on repeat, and it's super bizarre. And it sounds like jazz, modern, weird. It's weirder than any song on the record that I know of. And that's, that's it. I don't know why I even came on here to tell you about it. Julian Casablancas told you what he thought the song was. It's weird. How, Sway? It's a weird song, okay? And it goes four half steps up, moving on a cycle, even the theme, even the title, Infinity, repeating, kind of a stupid fake deep title. Whoa, can infinity repeat? Oh, or is infinity just repetition? Whoa. But I love it. I now love the song. It's snazzy, it's jazzy. I especially love how it cascades at the end and gets kind of distorted and unpleasant. I was shocked going back listening to, to Random Access Memories for an album that's so full of harmony and gorgeousness. How many times it's like bothering you? How many times it does things that are jarring or unexpected or abrupt? And this has that feeling, except it has this double guitar noodle line. I know where this comes from. Have you smashed the like bucket yet? Seriously, like, I don't know why Daft Punk fans have not found my videos and I'm a little bit offended because like my video on Darlin, I think is the best video on YouTube about Darlin, the band that Daft Punk was in before Daft Punk, but but like no one's watched that video. <sighs> it's okay. It's just, I thought, you know, I think I'm pretty good at talking about Daft Punk. Maybe I'm not. Tell me in the comments why I'm not. But I, I figured out the end of the song. I figured out these, this crazy guitar line. I believe it is primarily inspired by the song The Mexican by Babe Ruth. One of the earliest songs in hip hop history. It was sampled a ton back in 73, 74, and it has this double curly guitar sound. Listen to that song, then listen to this song, and I think you'll hear it. So why wasn't this on the album? It's undercooked. It's just, it's not, it doesn't actually fit into the album at all. And Casablancas understands that. To be fair though, Instant Crush doesn't really fit on the album either. There's a, there's a, there's a degree to which a couple songs 
uh, you know, doing it right and instant crush, I would say don't even really fully fit thematically, but they're so good and they're so well made that the quality of the music compensates for the lack of stylistic cohesiveness. But uh, I think this would have been too much of an outlier. Um, but wow, <laughs> I ended up really liking the song. This will probably be the song that I listen to the most off of, off of the EP. Then we get to the Get Lucky early take. Hmm, what's the difference between this and the final version? It's missing the most important element of the song. It's instrumental. So you think it's Pharrell, but it's not. Who cares if Pharrell's on here? What it's missing, again, is Nile Rodgers. Okay, Nile Rodgers. And that's not Nile Rodgers. But Nile Rodgers, uh, if you don't know him, he's got like, uh, like, like lots of like, like long hair and... You know, he's, wait, I'll show you what Nile Rogers looks like. He's on the poster. Hey, Ed, you also get an unboxing here. I'll show you what Nile Rogers looks like. That's, that's what Nile Rogers looks like. He looks like that. There he is playing guitar, lead and rhythm at the same time. Lose yourself to dance. All right, we'll get there soon. <clears throat> Sorry. Everything's going south over here. Um, so, you know, what, why is this on here? You know, first of all, probably, uh, even, that's going to bug me. Um, even though Get Lucky was like the big hit off the album, I still love the song and I especially love the little instrumental outro at the very end. So this has that feeling great. The way the sort of keyboards kind of blare the each chord change. It almost has, it almost sounds like at a certain point, the breakdown in the song touch, but why is this here? Why is this here on, on this? I believe it's so you can hear Omar Hakim break down, say one, two, three, four. I think that's why it's here. I think this is a way to listen to Omar Hakim. I will include another link in the description of Omar Hakim, again on Modern Drummer, explaining how he makes this drum beat. And the simplicity of the drum beat and the little ways that, because the drum beat, in essence, is the simplest drum beat. The first drum beat when I teach people how to play drums. But he just does a little hi-hat flourish. Just here and there, better than I just did. And that's what makes it work. It's just a reminder of what a great, subtle, and amazing drummer he is. That's why I think this is here. Flip the album over, okay? Because if, if you actually have the vinyl, this is side B of the EP, we get to the song Prime. <sighs> Remember I was talking about like uh, transformation? Metamorphosis. This shows, this is a Tron outtake. Say Tron outtake five times in a row. See if you don't say Tron outtake. Tron outtake, Tron outtake, Tron outtake, Tron outtake, Tron outtake. Good. It is so similar <laughs> to a Tron song, especially the way the keyboards are rhythmically playing like the same note for like one measure, double, 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 double. Then it develops. We start to see the transition. There's a crescendo of a drum beat. There's a little click track of a bass drum. There's more movement. It's less of a soundtrack. It's more of a song of itself. You know, it's a, it's a soundtrack to itself, some eurythmic style uh, keyboards at some point. And then eventually it reaches this sort of like Rocky-esque sound, you know, like there's these these like bass synthesizers and then like these disco strings kind of going back again to the uh, going back again to the uh, Give life back to music uh, Sound of these strings, but you can sort of imagine Rocky climbing up the stairs in Philadelphia dun, 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 Has that kind of triumphant feel some kind of space age synthesizers as well Why wasn't this on the album? It's not very good this, 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 it's better than anything I could make in a thousand years, okay? If you give me a thousand monkeys, a million years, we would never make something this good. But for Daft Punk, it's not particularly good. I'm happy to have it because it shows the seams. It shows us this This is the teenager in between the child of Tron and the adult of Random Access Memories. Then we get to the Lose Yourself to Dance vocoder. So... When you love an album as much as I love 
random access memories and you know that you're getting a bonus disc, you know, there's something that you circle and you can't wait to listen to and you think is going to be the best, you know, like with that revolver release, uh, you know, there's like alternate takes of Yellow Submarine, which I was super excited about. And, you know, the, the, the Pet Sounds box set has the acapella version and you just know that's going to be so exciting. There's certain things you just get really excited for. This was absolutely what I circled when I saw the track list, and it did not disappoint. This is my favorite part on the whole EP. And the reason why is it emphasizes something that they do the best on Random Access Memories that they do throughout their entire career. It's the humans of it all. It's the humans after all of it all. It's the humanity of the robots. It's the fact that they use these vocoders to be their most human selves. They look like robots, they sound like robots, and through that, they arrive at this kind of humanity, which is like the best reflection, I don't know, for our time or of them as artists. While at the same time, they're just goofing around. Like the melody, you know, we hear for all just for a second here. Um, again, no, no Nile Rodgers on here at all. So the song is, is hardly lacking. But what we hear is just these two humans, you know, these two robots goofing around together trying to find the proper lyrics. Like just searching around. Like basically being like, You're my fire. You're my desire. You take me higher. You are a liar. To which I aspire. But no. Like they're just trying to figure it out. And you can hear it here. And what's great is that the two different voices are actually very clear. I want to thank... Uh, lyric genius because I suspected something that they confirmed there so hopefully they're right because as you know lyric genius is always correct tell me in the comments how right I am so you know Giman the gold one uh, has the faster more accented voice like he has a, a thicker accent like you never hear him speaking like I don't think I've ever heard him speak English ever whereas Toma tends to be the one who speaks out so Silver Tommy Goldman Giman Gold and Silver Tommy does the more expressive less rhythmic bits here. So that everybody dancing on the floor, you know, that's uh, that's the gee man with his accent, whereas the other stuff, you know, like the lose yourself and why, 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 that's Toma. And you actually hear them, and then we get to the chorus, they're interlocking, the two different styles interlock. And when you listen to the, to the final version after listening to this, you realize, that the vocoder gets really reduced in the name of Pharrell. I mean, here we have Tomas singing basically all the melody of Lose Yourself to Dance. This could have been like Beyond or Within, and it would have been a totally different song. And I'm gonna go, I'm gonna say something a little bit scandalous here. There's a chance that it would have been a better song. I love Lose Yourself to Dance, but what if it was like Nile Rodgers and the robots and just vocoders? I don't know. But the final version is a much more kind of mellow song with the vocoder. It just has these two parts, you know, come on, 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 everybody dancing on the floor. It's much more kind of muted uh, and mellow in the final version. So, you know, uh, why is it not this way? I think they want to make a more poppy song. I think they knew that, that they needed another single, and I think they knew that Pharrell was the way to get there because they had yet to find The Weeknd. And... That's just my theory, by the way. I know Pharrell's a great artist and an amazing producer, and um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not capping, not, I'm not uh, capping is an old term for dissing. I'm not dissing Pharrell, um, but this just it was a different direction for the song, and perhaps the only time I wish they went in that direction. We then get to writing of fragments of time. This is the opposite of uh, Infinity Repeating. So Infinity Repeating is a song that I didn't like the first time, but I'm going to listen to the most. Writing of Fragments of Time is a song that I'm so, I, I'm so happy to have, but I'm never going to listen to again. Like after I do this video and I give you this whole breakdown, I'm, never, I'm going to skip that every single time. I'm going to be mad that you can't skip on vinyl because I'm going to have to listen in the back. But I'm so happy that it's here. And I think it's here for an important reason. I think they know that we want the scraps, but we also want to be a fly on the wall. They're showing, their, they're showing the seams, they're showing the brush strokes, they're showing how these things are made. And here we have a fly on the wall in the studio. And this is what we can piece together. Todd Edwards 
and Daft Punk have been working together for three weeks to create this song. Arguably the best song on the album. Well, there's three other songs that are the best song on the album. Four, five, maybe other best songs on the album. This is one of the best songs of the album. And this is them singing at the very end. So they were... And why this is so important, as this being the behind the scenes, because this shows how important the collaboration is. We are always looking for the lone genius. You know, that's maybe why you know, Pet Sounds is such a, uh, a fascinating draw for music nerds, because it's just the Beach Boys were on tour and, and Brian Wilson was alone with these studio musicians and putting on fire hats and screaming into the wilderness and making the greatest album of all time. Uh, and we sort of want to apply that to them, but, but they are so insistent that we not do that. The, all the promotional material was the collaborators, not them. The whole thing is about collaboration. And this little scrap here shows you how collaborative of an album it is. I did not know anything about Todd Edwards before he was on this. I didn't know who he was. I thought he might have been like some like cheesy pop singer or something. I didn't know. I didn't even realize that he was the face-to-face -face guy. I didn't know that he was a famous house producer. I didn't realize he was even just some, like if you watch him on Collaborators, he's just some Jersey dude. Like if you've lived on the East Coast, you know Jersey dude. He reminds me exactly of my friend John. He's just a Jersey dude, you know? But in watching the collaborators, I realized for the first time yesterday, <laughs> my favorite part of my favorite album is made by this random Jersey dude. The bit in the chorus where everything is chopped up in fragments of time, that's Todd Edwards, obviously with Daft Punk, but that's him. You know, how awesome is that? So we get this song about, we get this scrap of a song that ends up being a song about making the song. The best way, by the way, to, to listen to this song is to, uh, or listen to this track, is to follow along with lyrics on Lyric Genius so you can see who's speaking when. Giman is not, not there. I don't know if he's not there or if he's not speaking because he's shy because of his English levels. I don't know. So Tomas says, so you know, this song is about Todd coming here and making the song, working with us. I would never leave, keep building these random memories. What? The song's about the music? It's not a love I I think of this as one of the most desperately romantic songs. I that's how I think of this. Just a just a gorgeously romantic song about a lover who he remembers through through a, a fog. But it's about music? <laughs> it's about making the song. It's a meta commentary on making the song. To which Todd Edwards says, um, okay, all right, so um, uh, exactly, exactly. So the thing exactly, exactly is I can't stay, but it's like the whole concept is I can't stay. So that's the whole concept. And then you realize, you know, this, it might be the center of the album. This might be the most important part of the album because it's about making music. And this album is partly about making music with collaborators and also the difficulty of holding on to memories. And what's hilarious is that <laughs> this song is one of the most moving and bittersweet songs about the fleeting nature of memory, the, the transient states of mind. It's able to describe in an ineffable way a bunch of ineffable feelings and thoughts, okay? This is an amazing song for doing that. It, it explains the unexplainable in a way that cannot be easily explained. That's how these lyrics are constructed. They're not linear. There's a, there's a transcendent quality to these lyrics where you can't go word by word and say what they mean. But then you hear this guy, this dude from Jersey, <laughs> just say, do you think the line should, I think this would be a good thing. Should the line reflect that things that can't stay the same? Like in other words, I wish that it could always remain today, like type of thing. Like, should it be that? Like that might help in writing it. Like in other words, you know? So they arrived at this thing that I just described, that uh, transcendent description of the transient states of mind and the, and the tenuousness of memory and the, 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 the glory of nostalgia and love and connecting to your past while trying to maintain uh, an existence in the present. It all came from that word diarrhea salad that Todd Edwards just threw out there. And then when they get it together... You hear them go, woohoo, because they got it. You actually get to hear the moment. You hear the moment where the artists have cracked it, okay? With an album this perfect, there had to be a 
series of, of moments where they just go, ah, oh, we got it. We're looking for something and we got it. You know, like like maybe the uh, Nile Nile Rogers like little diddle diddle do on on get lucky. You know, like I could imagine them just going like, oh, oh, that's that. Like all these little tiny moments, and this helped me to realize, also, in listening to Todd Edwards on this talk about it, <laughs> and you know, I'll be right back. I have to grab a prop here. You know, I love my props. Where is it? Wait, I can't find my prop. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So, uh, sometimes people ask me, uh, what do I do to read? What should I read? So, uh, this is my copy of Proust. Um, this is actually a first edition. According to Proust, the first uh, copy of a book you read is a first edition of the book. So, this is a genuine first edition Proust. It's priceless. Um, so, so, in this book and in, in, in his works, Proust, uh, who every French person has read, uh, and knows fairly well. I, that's not really an exaggeration, I don't think. Uh, he's famous for writing about memory, right? The Madeleine and the connection between sense and memory. And there's a little bit of that here. But <laughs> the thing that Todd Edwards talks about is how sad he is that this experience is going to end. And there's a degree to which that is, at, that's one of the things that Proust talks about, where he <laughs> he's, he's totally up in his head. He's just such a nerd. He's like... He, he is sad about something that he's looking forward to because he knows it's going to be over, okay? So like, I'm so excited to play this new Zelda game, but I'm already sad for the time where I finish all the shrines because then I will no longer have shrines to look forward to. It's a bizarre, bittersweet, complex relationship to memory, the past, present, and joy, which are all communicated in Proust's work and in the final song of Fragments of Time. And we have Todd Edwards in here, and he's just like, that's so sweet. Like, he gets it. He gets how sweet it is. And then we have all these great, like, merry mix-ups, you know? <laughs> Where Todd says, there's so many possibilities for it to be rhymed easily. Faces I've never seen. And then Thomas, being French, English is not his first language, he hears faces I've never seen. He hears fantasy. Fantasy, uh, we are doing that in another song. Todd. I didn't say fantasy. I said I've seen faces in dreams. Oh, you didn't? Oh. Oh, familiar faces I've never seen instead of doing, instead of doing unfamiliar faces. It still feel like familiar faces I've never seen, you know? Todd. I love it. It's, <laughs> that's so crazy. The idea of describing familiar faces you've never seen as a way of saying unfamiliar faces, it's beautiful and it's this merry mix-up where he hears the word fantasy and he ties it into another song. And then we understand, thanks to this little behind the scenes moment, that the, the, the lyrics, even though they're like co-written with all these different people, there really is a through line, and I'll be getting to that in my big old video this summer where I talk about this album, where, Toma, uh, where, where Todd says, you know, half-remembered dream. And, and Tomas says, oh, there's something like that in Touch, the, so you know, the song Touch. Todd, oh really, that's crazy, I didn't even pick that up. Toma, a half-remembered song. Yeah, that's exciting me, says Toma Bongote. Perfect franglicism, <laughs> ça m'excite. Uh, Todd, yeah, but I swear, it all just came up. That connection is like crazy. Toma, scene and dream, that's cool too. Dream, a dream, a dream within a dream, that's in touch. Yeah, there's a word dream everywhere. Todd, yeah, and that's, and that's fine, has kind of a connection. A rainbow connection. A congruency, yeah. The familiar faces line, man, that's to be able to express something so great and like almost a haiku, you know what I mean? Like you only have a few syllables to say that. Toma, familiar faces I've never seen, but yeah, that's totally my alley of California vibes, you know? And that's what they're trying to go for this whole song were California vibes. So we have the whole process, how the album connects from song to song through serendipity or kismet or coincidence. It's a coincidence, whatever it is. It's not actually because Daft Punk, the robots, were creating this atmosphere that, per, that created these kinds of thoughts, okay? The words that come up with our collaborators are dreams and fantasies and memories for a reason. People aren't showing up and randomly thinking, you know, elbows and uh, syrup, okay? Like the words that are coming into their head that these artists are thinking of are actually coming out of the music. We're, we're seeing something that cannot be described or put onto paper happen in this behind the scenes thing where the, the vibe is being created. The emotional heart is being created. 
I also made this meme. I post I posted it to the Reddit meme on Daft Punk, but they didn't approve it. So, um, <laughs> I believe he says exactly nine times. I thought that he was coked up the first time I listened to it, because uh, like, yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it's like it's like it's like it's like, it's like, like exactly that. Uh, but I don't think so. I think he's just so excited um, by uh, by just this process. Do they speak English in exactly, Todd? Please. Please, please tell me that's a good meme in the comments. I feel spited. And then the album ends with the previously mentioned touch. And this is funny because I this allowed me to create my deepest, furthest out theory that turned out to be completely banal. My theory was that this should have been the end to the album. That touch should have been the end of Random Access Memories. That we're on splintering timelines here, okay? This is the hero of time that lived and the hero of time that didn't, right? So, so we have... Contact being the last song in Random Access Memories is perfect if Daft Punk is not broken up, okay? Because that's spiraling out into space, that's going away from memories, that's going towards the future, that's going outwards, that's a conclusion that sounds very similar, that's a conclusion that closes a door and opens a window, okay? That's the kind of trick that you're supposed to do or the conclusion that is leading you into space beyond. But because they broke up, Contact is not actually the best ending to their catalog. It's the best ending to that song. But the best ending is Touch with these lyrics. So this was my revolutionary take that this should have been the last track. This should have been the last thing we heard before Daft Punk broke up. Isn't it amazing that I figured that out? Oh yeah, and then yesterday I was just goofing around on YouTube. I've never even watched the breakup video of Daft Punk because I was too upset. <laughs> I felt like watching it would make it real, you know? Like, I didn't want to bury Daft Punk, so I never even watched the video. So I just happened to watch it yesterday, and it's this. <laughs> it's this. It is the end of Touch. It is the children's chorus echoing the beginning with the, the overture that we hear at the beginning. This nice series of voices that starts and ends this EP. And that was the actual end. That was actually, they went back and retroactively made sure that the last things you heard were these words. Hold on, if love is the answer, you're home. And by the way, I learned what the lyrics were yesterday, two days ago, three days ago when I was in the car and I listened to this outtake. I always thought the lyrics were, hold on, if love is the answer, you'll hold, hold on. <laughs> but it turns out it's, if love is the answer, you're home, which is a much nicer way to end it. So my far out theory was not that far out at all. This gives them the chance to fix the mistake, the unintentional mistake. They could not have known that they were going to break up. Now, the official last words from Daft Punk are this moment of clarity and resolution and hope and love and humanity. Okay, how's that? Could you share this around? Like, tell people it's good, if you think it's good? Because damn it, I want my Daft Punk videos to take off. I love Daft Punk. That's the stupidest thing. You know that. All right. Until next time, uh, there's the camera. Uh, what's your favorite song on the album? I'm supposed to ask you questions so you comment more. What's your favorite song on this whole thing? You can tell me that. There's the camera.